Welcome to another edition of WTF 2020, an influencer's guide to navigating the shit show. Today, our virtual WTF 2020 bus tour takes us to the Jersey Shore and the captain of data, a workforce and HR data scientist and analyst, my good friend, Andrew Godomsky. My motivation for starting this series was simple. On many days, I just became consumed, distracted, disheartened, shocked, and horrified by the continuing dishonesty and dysfunction we are subjected to on a daily basis. I was feeling completely overwhelmed and decided to reach out to a group of doers, of influencers, of smart, successful people I've met and interviewed over the past 15 years to find out how they are able to tune out the bullshit and focus on the positive, how they're able to stay productive, and what advice they can share with mere mortals such as myself. Here's a brief on Andrew, and I scraped this right off of his LinkedIn profile because it is so well written. Andrew started Aspen Advisors in 2006, name changed to Aspen Analytics in 2018, because he saw an opportunity to help the many recruiting and HR departments that were burning time and money on tools they didn't understand, using training that was taught once and forgotten, and engaging vendors who could not prove their service value, let alone find and respect candidates consistently. Most of HR and the C-suite didn't get Andrew's vision. No surprise there, right? As Andrew noted, ego checking is not exactly a LinkedIn registered skill, Andrew was talking about data and business analytics in 2006, back when guessing, gut feel, and we've always done it that way, reigned supreme. He learned to teach during the sale and became a pretty good instructor in the process. Quoting Andrew, flash forward 10 years and several hundred thousand hires later, it's been a wild ride working with the world's largest companies and staffing agencies. In 2008, NYU asked Andrew to join their staff as an adjunct professor. He loved it, got hooked on teaching and speaking, and have made education in the classroom and on the conference circuit a pillar in his career. And speaking from personal experience, anyone watching and listening to this who's had the benefit of participating in one of Andrew's classroom sessions or workshops knows he's damn good at it. Andrew has a BS in marketing and business logistics from Penn State University and a Master of Science in Business and Analytics from the NYU Stern School of Business. Well, Andrew, it's great to see you and have this opportunity to catch up. So, thank you, Peter. How's life on the Jersey Shore? <laughs> how are you? How's your family? What the hell's going on? I mean, you know, I mean, we're we're blessed. Uh, I live in a, in a region of the country uh, that uh, was spiking early uh, uh, in regards to COVID, but we got a little a little house that's uh, a couple of blocks from a beach, and uh, Adeline is in remote school and she enjoys it, and uh, she's enjoying um, you know third grade. I, I'm hopeful that I'll be able to pass third grade math. Yeah. Um, we'll we'll see. Uh, but you know, I mean, you know, I mean, look, we, you can complain about a lot of things. Our, our business, uh, our business has done well in, in COVID. Uh, I, I'm doing a lot of work for, uh, the U S government and, uh, helping them support some of the activities related to COVID. Um, and, uh, we've had other companies come to us and, uh, they're really, um, trying to figure out, uh, the remote work and distributed workforce. Uh, and figure out how they're going to do that workforce planning. And that's part of what we do and um, and figuring out new recruiting strategies for them that will be distributed. You know, how do they address the compensation issues around different geographies and not having people come into the office? What do you do? Um, and um, we've, we've been working with uh, a couple of uh, multinationals around diversity and inclusion. And that's a very unique um problem. If you're a global business and you are saying things like, we are going to be more diverse, I unless you've actually really done the work, you don't understand how many data attributes that is. It's almost over a thousand. Wow. You know, 
So it's, 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 it's fascinating how the country of China labels legally people, which is different than Germany, which is different than Israel, which is different than the United States, which is different than Canada, which is different than the United Kingdom, and so on and so forth. And so when you have an organization that's operating in 60 countries with 100,000 people, and you say, we hire X, well, it's not that easy to do. You have to be able to do the data analytics to say, yes, we are taking care of underrepresented groups in all the regions that we operate, in all the countries that we operate. We have wage parity. It's a big lift. It, it certainly is. It. And, you know, that brings to mind, I, I recently did an interview with Jeff Wald, who is the co-founder of Work Market, which was bought by ADP. And, you know, we got into this whole conversation about every state defines employment differently, right? And so it's, it's not just Germany versus China, it's, you know, West Virginia versus New Jersey versus California. What the hell is an employee? And every state has their own definition. And, and not only do they have their own definition, uh, they have different legal aspects associated right. with it, right to work states, et cetera. And then um, in addition, there are uh, protected classes that are not at the federal level, but they are at the state level. Right. And so um, as an example, uh, and this is not probably well known, you know, there are protected classes in certain states around not hiring smokers. And so you can't discriminate against someone who is a smoker. Um, but at the same time in, you know, and there's any number of examples like that, right? Where, um, or people who have been uh, abused as an example. So mm -hmm. if uh, someone has been in a court case uh, around abuse and they were a victim and that has been come to pass in some, in, in many states, you can't discriminate against someone's past history of abuse as as a means to why you can't hire them. Maybe you know you make leaps around psychological, you know, state of mind and those kinds of things. You know, but in Canada, you know, you you know, this is a hot topic right now, but you can't discriminate based on political uh, party affiliation, but you can in the United States. Right. Sort and of. It, it, sort of. Yeah. And, sort and, of. It, and it's sort of has become even uh, more po polarized. Right. And and I think that, I think from a data, pers in, in terms of data and how it operates in employment, we tend to think of the United States, and I throw up the air quotes mm -hmm. for our podcasters. Um, the fact is, is it's almost like 50 countries. And then it right. gets even more complicated as we start adding things like cities that have their own city or uh, city laws around wages, around uh, disclosures. The state of Illinois, as an example, if you're using an assessment tool or artificial intelligence to um, hire someone or as part of the assessment process, you have to disclose that now. It's a law. Wow. I mean, so there's, it has become more complicated. So I guess I'm blessed that we're busy. <laughs> Well, you know, and you're also blessed that you're a data geek because you understand all I this try. shit. <laughs> so I certainly try. I don't, I don't mind being, you know, you know, I, I you know, I, I could have been a lot of things, but I, I'll take data geek. That's fine. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, yeah. Especially now. So, so how has the past eight months changed your business, and and how have you pivoted to virtual everything? So we were. Um, we were already pretty savvy when it came to virtual work. My team has been remote to me and remote to each other really for the past decade. So uh, I've had people in my office, forgive that, but the, those dishes in the background is my mother doing dishes. So, uh, but uh, the, we've been, you know, the past 10 years, uh, we've been very virtual. Um, I think the changes that we had to make, and we started really before the pandemic, um, the first was we've had a partnership with GSMI, um, the producers of the Social Recruiting Strategies Conference, eBrandCon, right. for since really 2016 on what's called the Talent Congress. 
And one so, of my favorite events. Yeah. And and we would do usually once, at least once a year, if not twice a year, a workshop uh, that was several hours uh, for talent acquisition leaders just around data analytics. Mm-hmm. And so I would lead that event. We moved uh, in, you know, Kara McNelly and I uh, and Scott Grossman, who's a new producer, we're working on what exactly we're doing for the upcoming talent acquisition week. I'll be emceeing that. But to get to get better at at the talent congress and education, we partnered with a company to create curriculum. And so I was writing curriculum as early as November uh, and we produced. Uh, so this is a part of the new business. Um, we produced uh, 20 hours of online curriculum. It's powered by AIHR out in Europe, uh, and it's part of a talent acquisition certification. And it's 20 hours on data analytics and recruiting and retention. Um, That's really exciting. So, so that was a that was a pivot where I said I don't think we're going to be doing as many in person things. How am I going to replace that? And we've had a couple hundred people sign up very quickly. That's exciting. Um, I think that was a pivot. The other pivot that we had started pre-pandemic, but it really came into play uh, quickly, is we used to go on site for all of our data analytics work. We would call it a sprint. So mm-hmm. we would go usually for a week. We would sit on their, you know, on their facility, on their firewall, on their equipment. Um, we moved to working with corporate-owned equipment. Um, back in uh, 18. But now, I mean, I've got three laptops sitting around me right now. And they're all, I mean, so we only do business with companies now that send us equipment. I mean, and everyone's figured out how to do that. Right. I mean, you've had to in the pandemic. But yeah, we're on your VPN, your equipment. So we got rid of... um, we got rid of using third-party tools that we had white labeled uh-huh. as as like a data analysis ecosystem. A long time ago, a while ago, I had a product called Pando, where you would log in, and we had done things like the Candidate Experience Awards back in thirteen and fourteen. And you right. know, for a long time, I had that that program. And what we've done is now I just say no, no. You've got Microsoft Power BI, you've got Tableau, you've got SizeSense, I don't care. We will take your data from your systems on your computers, on your machines, and on your servers. We will blend it together and we will do our analysis on your stuff. And then you can ask us to go away. Now they pay a retainer, but now we, I mean, you're not doing business with us unless you send us a laptop. That's really you know interesting. Uh, and, you know, part of what I find so fascinating about the last eight months is all of these things corporations said you could never do. All of a sudden, hey, yeah, we can send Andrew a laptop. You know, a yeah. year ago, uh, you know, probably corporate security. Oh, we, we can't, you know, we can't release. Uh, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll <laughs> admit, I'll admit we were well prepared. Right. So right. most of the clients that I work with, um, I, look, I, I'm my building. I'm not in it right now, but my building in this little sleepy town of Ventnor is a federally approved building to do government work, which is unusual. How cool I mean, is that? Got, <laughs> yeah, I mean, so I mean, we've got the Department of Commerce, Department of Veterans Affairs, Secret Service have all been in this building. Right. So we've got like magnetic key cards and security and you know, all kinds of stuff in the building, which is great. So, right. so the, you know, Wall Street loves that. Washington loves that. So I've never really had security problems about working remotely. But what that's also done is just put, I, I think people understand quickly, wow, if, if you really do have good security, we can work with you. And uh, I think what it's probably done for from some of our colleagues is it's woken them up to the importance of security, cybersecurity, or infrastructure security for their businesses. If if you're a if you're in the services business in HR like I am, and you don't have a cybersecurity and infrastructure security plan, I don't know how you're getting business done. You just 
not with data. Right. You've got to have a way to say, yes, we are secure. And so the easiest way that we do it is, oh, yeah, you send us your equipment and we got lock boxes that are behind magnetically keyed doors. It's kind of like you and I are old enough to remember Get Smart. Yeah. You know, and how, you know, how he walks through like multiple doors right, and right. all that stuff. That's why I feel like when I'm going to the office. That's awesome. <laughs> Um, well, sort of uh, to stay with the, the the idea of you're working with these large corporations, what are they telling you now, Andrew? And is there a, a common thread amongst all of these very large companies and concerns or things that they are projecting for 2021? So, um, so there, it, it kind of, so realize that we tend to work with, um, mostly and this is because we do a lot of so much federal work Mm -hmm. i don't work with uh companies as much that are headquartered and have headquartered and or have significant foreign interests okay so it makes it difficult so as an example it would be unusual for me to work directly with uh uh, a german-based business that had 85 percent of its revenue in germany right Mm -hmm. the federal government's going to say why are you doing that So I don't do that stuff anymore. Um, So most of this is U.S. or organized. I think one thing that I'm hearing uh, is what how are we going to make hires in 2021 when we likely are not going to be interviewing people uh, live? And so. The quick shortcut is, oh, we'll just use Zoom or we'll use Skype or we'll, you know, we'll call Emo at Outmatch or we'll call, you know, Nathan at HireView, right? I mean, all right. those things, right? But I'm starting to get more s- strategic work around do we completely change and go to an event based model? And now what we're looking at is companies are thinking that during this week of the month, this is when interviews happen and we make decisions then. Uh. So rather than this concept of let's open a job when it's open and put it in the applications applicant, applicant tracking system, post it the next day, and then it has a life of its own and then it gets filled when it gets filled. It's wait a minute, we're all remote. We have all these tools. Why aren't we telling our managers, this is when you make decisions? And then what we do is now we're controlling the flow of uh, the flow of candidates and the flow of onboarding, because part of the problem is onboarding has become more virtual. So we, we don't have classes of people coming in. And so it's and you don't have, wait, this is your first day and you're showing up. So all of a sudden we're getting a lot of conversations and strategy around why don't we just make the third week of the month hiring week? Huh, interesting. Well, and this has to be completely changing the the college recruiting totally. efforts. Yeah, my my nephew, my nephew keeps calling me and you know, you know, he's like, if I go through one more digital interview, I'm gonna vomit. Right. He's <laughs> he's had it, you know, he's He's getting his master's of finance at the Cranert School at Purdue. Smart kid. And, you know, but he's like, is this how they're doing it now? And I'm like, pretty much, Matthew. Yeah. It's just how it is. But I think so. So one thing I'm so, so the one thing I'm hearing is how do we do virtual hiring, virtual interviewing, virtual onboarding? And I'm starting to see more models around don't do it one requisition at a time control it and schedule it in in blocks that makes sense and so right? that's new yeah. right that that's a big shift i think another shift is the use of assessment tools and um this is also crossing into uh there's an overdue set of there's an overdue set of processes and procedures around diversity and inclusion, fairness, wage equity. It's well overdue. I'm excited that that the country has been polarized by it, that has uh, that has gotten excited about it, that is talking about it. And, and I appreciate the good and the bad 
noise, right, that has occurred. But what has occurred is, Andrew, how do we stay fair? And um, there's a lot of how, what, what assessments should we turn on? How do we make sure that those assessments are fair? Um, and, uh, and then there's also a lot of discussion about how internal candidates can go for jobs that are outside their current skill set, and do they go through the same processes as external candidates, which I find to be really, really interesting, right? So, so I guess my kid is done with school or something. So this is this is what Zoom's all about, right? This is yeah, uh, this is it real. life life in 2020 right now. Yeah, yeah, and that, yeah but you know, as a side note. I love that. I love being on a Zoom call and then like some like kid like pops up. Right. You know, right it makes yeah. it makes this so much more real, right? Exactly. Um, so so I think the DNI, uh, so diversity, inclusion, belonging, there's any number of nomenclature around this. What I look at um, and where I've gotten a lot of traffic is can you help us understand demographics, right? And that's really what we're being asked. It's, it might be very specific and a sharp question. We wanna hire more X leader, uh, more leaders who are X, right? Okay, but when you peel that back, what I'm hearing is, do we have a diverse organization now? What are we measuring that against? We don't know what to measure it against. And if we wanna make goals, what are the goals and the targets that we can make that are politically, technically, and financially feasible, right? Uh -huh. And I, I recently, yes, honey? Uh, okay. Okay, so he doesn't have, he doesn't, there's no gym class today? Okay, well, daddy's, all right, so daddy's on the, on the Zoom. You want to say hi to Peter? That's okay. Come say hi to Peter. <laughs> Sorry, Peter. That's all right. Okay. So I haven't seen it. Addy. Addy, you're growing up. How you doing? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Say bye bye. Okay. Bye, Peter. Bye. bye. You can have some Swedish food. Yeah. <laughs> so I think part of the the D and I conversation, um, those questions have gotten a lot sharper. And people are starting to ask, okay, Andrew, where do the analysis tell us where our hotspots are? And I don't think they really knew where they were. And so I'm having a lot more conversations and I can expect to have more conversations and analyses. And, and like, here's an example. I had a dialogue the other day. It says, are we underrepresented? And I'm like, you have to ask that question slightly sharp, with a little more sharpness. And they're like, where are we underrepresented? I'm like, that's a better question, right? And I said, here's where you're underrepresented. You are underrepresented. Hey, Addy. Addy, mom. <laughs> Give me a, look in the background. Um, where you were underrepresented is um, specifically in this demographic. So as an example, this organization um, was, uh, it was one particular demographic and they were off on the national average. They were off on the local average. They were, I mean, and, and they were just like, oh, and it, and it wasn't, let's be specific. It wasn't white. It wasn't black, right? They were surprised. And I'm like, okay, so let's really have the dialogue what we need to have. You want to have fair representation. You want to not be underrepresented. Here we, we, we're sitting here and, and we're talking about this country. These are the demographics. You've got, if you want to be fair and balanced, you're going to have to be fair and balanced for every demographic we're talking about, not just one, right? So let's get real about that. So now the question is, is in a time where there may be a very hot topic in a particular region, right, around particular demographics, you're gonna now start talking about how you're underrepresented in a demographic that is not part of the social thread right now. Is that, how do you feel about that? How are you gonna do that? Now you have to educate people. We have not done this. And all of a sudden I'm, I'm starting to see that, so the theme I'm seeing 
is a better awareness and a more strategic viewpoint of of uh, DNI, and it's not about the demographics as much. It's about let's raise awareness and tell people the problems, and then say this is where we need your help, employees. This is what we're going to be doing. I mean, I think the transparency is great. Um, so DNI is another very very hot topic, but I'm playing with it at a global scale or at a federal scale. Um, that, that's really interesting, and yeah. and I'm wondering because. You know, I think this is somewhat reflective of the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, that corporation, you know, the DNI thing has become much more uh, top of mind with companies uh, because of because of Black Lives Matter. Would you agree with that? Oh, sure. I mean, I think I, I think that that's a very um, I think from a U.S. perspective. There's no question that that has served as a catalyst uh, with organizations and they are, um, you know, it's tough to make a blanket statement about every organization. But if someone says, oh, yes, diversity and inclusion is important, I think it's kind of ridiculous to assume that the Black Lives Matter had no attribution whatsoever associated with those new dialogues. I think that's ridiculous. Right. Yeah. Now it may be secondhand. So I think what's interesting, and what I mean by secondhand is just as how people are talking about diversity and inclusion because of certain catalysts like Black Lives Matter, we're talking about things like work from home and the continued work from home. And that's become a trend too. So, you know, you know, Jack, Jack at, at Twitter says everybody can work from home forever. It didn't take long for other tech companies to say, oh, my God, we got to do the same thing. Right. So realize that some of the movement that has occurred because of diversity and inclusion is also because companies are becoming more transparent with their policies and their competitors are saying that's the right thing to do. It may right. not be a direct result of say Black Lives Matter or any kind of local interests. It's just, it, it could just be as simple as bank one has said X. And so bank two, three, four, and five are following suit because they have to, they have to stay competitive. They have to, you know, you know, keep shareholder interests, keep stakeholder interests. Um, and, you know, candidly, they probably have a genuine, God, we have screwed this up. Right. And we have buried this in the back of the closet for a long time. And, and with remote and distributed workforce, I mean, companies who say that they can't find talent of certain demographics, if they're going to be working from home, are lying to you. No kidding. Give me a break. Now, here's the last one I've got. And this is a new one the last few weeks. People are really trying to figure out compensation. And the geography game of I work in the Bay Area and I make $100,000, but I move to Boise, Idaho. Will I still make $100,000 working for Facebook, Netflix, whoever? Right. But then at the same time, the companies are asking the questions, should we just hire in Boise? Or should we pay people to move there? <laughs> so instead of paying someone $150,000, you say, we'll give you $125,000, but you can do it in any one of these locations and we'll move you. And what ends up happening is they're relocating those folks and then they're also probably holding on to them a little bit longer. That's interesting. So, wow. so some of the data anal analysis that we're starting to, to, to get a hold of and, and, and ponder is, is it worth a $30,000 relocation to make sure that someone in your employee stays with you for the next four or five years rather than replacing them and replacing the IP that's associated with their learning? Maybe. Yeah. That's Especially in volume. 
I mean, right. A thousand people, 10,000 people, all of a sudden you're talking millions and hundreds of millions of dollars long term, you know. So these are the topics, right? And they're fun topics to talk about. They, they are. You know, there's no right answers. All models, all models have a lot, have some error in them. <laughs> so, um, but it's been interesting having these dialogues. I think everyone's genuinely interested in paying fair, keeping their people, getting people back to work, uh, doing that with innovation and doing that differently um, and have being fair and balanced in both wage, race, gender, disability, veteran status. That is all very hot right now. Yeah, and sort of uh, on that same topic of DNI, I, I recently interviewed Jackie Clayton, who mm -hmm. just joined Seek Out, which Great is hire. one of the um, yeah, which is one of these AI based um, you know programs that goes and and find candidates that alleg allegedly is bias free and all all of that kind of stuff, right? And it, you know, in, in in speaking with her, I mean, she is the reality check that they have brought into their company to say, yes, we are actually paying attention to this. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think you're absolutely right. I think you're going to see more of that happening. And, you know, on this topic of, um, you know, you, you keep seeing these news reports of people bailing out of San Francisco and out of New York City and, you know, these other very expensive urban areas, um, long term, that could really impact um, how these cities operate. Well, you know, there's the no San question. Francisco's. And yeah, there, there, there's no question. I mean, um, real estate valuation, right, and its connection to wealth has um, has uh, linkage to how people make career decisions. Because their because their because their wealth management engines shift. So a person, so two people who work in New York, who one of them has lost their job, but the other one can work remotely, and their real estate is going down, which is probably a significant portion of their portfolio, mm -hmm. right? Has a different longer term. How do I make money? How do I make wealth? than someone who is maybe in suburbia who can work from home, uh, who's a single income family, right? And so we've had some interesting financial disruptions based on real estate, which also then transcends to, well, why would I work? Or where do I work? Or what kind of work am I gonna do? Um, it's really, really early though, Peter. I mean, I like know. no studies, no longitudinal access, but I think that what we will see is I wonder if we are going to lose a portion of the effective workforce in the United States. So we hover historically since really the 40s. It changed in the 60s, but we've always been at around 38% of, of, the, of, the, of the effective labor force between the ages of 16 and 60, usually about 38% of the people um, of people work. And that kind of moved all the way up right until the, the Great Recession, not this past one, but the one before that, at around 41%. And then it went back to 38%. I wonder if we're going to start seeing with these, with this exodus from San Francisco, the exodus from New York, people moving out of the Chicago suburbs into Wisconsin, et cetera, right? I wonder if we're going to see people saying, I don't need to be a dual income house anymore. Hmm. Right. Yeah. I'm going to stay at home or I'm going to just be a gig worker and work a lot less. Why? Because my mortgage has been cut in half. And we haven't seen those impacts yet. Um, but I could foresee that um, between that and the baby, the, the last of the baby boomers retiring. I wonder if we're going to have a real strain on talent. Like a real, like, like, like one, like we haven't seen. Right. Wow. Yeah. That's and, interesting. And then it's like, well, there aren't people who were doing this work. We just lost a percentage of the workforce and we have people who are retiring and it's like, well, you know, and I don't think it's going to be knowledge workers. 
I don't think that's going to be the issue. I think the issue is going to be more technical facility oriented personnel. You know, who's going to repair your HVAC? Plumbers, welders, you know, we have a, I mean, I'm sure you've heard of the podcast that Jason Robertson and I do. We're talking about the, the, the tremendous shortage of warehouse, uh, warehouse workers. If right. you can't, it's the hottest market. Yeah. Finding someone to work $17 an hour. Exactly. That, that's what Katrina Kibben is doing right now is trying to find warehouse workers for Amazon. It's, it's, you know, there's just, but, but there's even specializations within those areas that are really struggling. Commercial drivers like uh, commercial drivers is struggling. Forklift operators is struggling. Safety inspectors, QA auditors, people with p- particular certifications, right. Who have to be facility oriented. And, and we start forgetting about that part of the workforce, especially in our cool little echo chamber, right? Mm-hmm. We're all talking about tech and programmers and executives. I mean, the, the, you know, no one was talking about healthcare workers until eight months ago, right? We're talking about right. now. Yeah. But I mean, there are real, there's going to be specialization gaps that are big yeah essential workers whoever talked about essential workers eight months ago people like you know the the subway drivers and bus drivers and like you're talking about these facilities folks you know the it guys who fix your computer what were the people who (laughs) fix okay so you know but it's also things that we it's even things like security guards like even things like that, that people who have specialized training or specialized licensing, the fact that people have lost jobs and facilities are gone away, guess what? People are just trying to start getting out of that work. So I think we've got some, we're going to have some bumps. It's not going to be, I don't think we're looking at massive, you know, I mean, someone will make an HR product for something that will solve a problem, right? For right. A, a hot minute, you know, but I think that we're looking at um, people will have, you know, companies will have to say, where are our hotspots? Where's our biggest needs? Where are our risks? If we were to lose these people, what does that mean for our business financially? If you're Comcast and you think that you are going to lose the ability to have field service personnel with electrical experience and you've got 6,000 of them, yeah, you need a plan. You need a plan, you need access to academics, you need a a retraining plan, you need a promotional plan, you need a rotation plan. You need those things because we know what you don't want, a bunch of a bunch of customers who can't get connected to the internet. Right? Right. These are good dialogues. I think I we're seeing more of that. So I want to return to something we talked about earlier, and uh, that is your talent acquisition certification program, certificate program. Give us some more details on that because I know that is going to close soon. And it renews. It renews. It renews. Okay. Yeah. So so tell us a little bit about it and how people can get involved in it. So we've partnered with the team for the Academy to Innovate Human Resources, uh, known as AIHR, group out of uh, uh, Europe. Um, they started primarily as an organization that was taking data, uh, it was taking uh, data analysts uh, who were in HR or data scientists who were in HR and they developed curriculum that was primarily for um, people who were in human resources or who needed um, analysis expertise or people who were in business intelligence or data scientists who needed HR expertise. And so you could go and get a course on the basics of recruiting, but it was designed for someone who knows how to do business intelligence in a major corporation. They know how to do data, but they don't know HR, right? And then vice versa. So they came, so so thanks to John Bastalica, because he was the guy who referred me to this. Um, they asked me to build a, a program that was how do you do data analytics and recruiting and retention with recruiting and retention data at a global scale? And so I came up with a program 
what they did is they pulled that as well as um, a course on design thinking, a course on employment branding, and then uh, a, a course on uh, the basics of recruiting, you know, so people understand the workflows. They strung those together to create a talent acquisition certification. And so if you are a, uh, and it's really probably designed, I would say, for someone who is a recruiter who wants to become a manager. It might be for an HR analyst who wants to go into management or deeper into uh, analytics. Um, but you can execute that, you can execute those courses. It's self-paced. It's like literally like, like the most awesome mobile platform ever. It's ridiculous. Like everything's on the phone and, you know, they make me look great and you know, they got <laughs> quizzes and, you know, and it was hard work. Right. But um, you take those courses and then you graduate and then you have a certificate. Um, I we, we've, we've developed a partnership where we have the ability to we actually now take that package, not necessarily the certification, although people can use it. But we're selling their entire library. Uh, to some of our customers as part of our retention package, our retainer package, um, because they just want to be smart on data. And they've got courses on statistics. They've got courses on how to use Power BI. They've got courses on like basics, which, okay, someone doesn't, you know, when I say out loud in a meeting, you know, consistency is to, you know, people say, how do I know that we're consistent? And I'm like, because your mean, your mode, and your range are all close together. And they're like, what the hell does that mean? I'm like, God, hey, <laughs> like, don't didn't you guys all go to school? You know, <laughs> but, you know, so I, I'm excited about the partnership with AIHR. I'm excited about this talent acquisition certification. Um, it's different because I think the employment branding and the recruiting basics are, I think you can get a lot of places, but roping that into design thinking and project management, and then having, you know, 20 hours of analytics, you know, you come out of this and you're just thinking very diff differently as a talent acquisition leader, because you're very data focused, you're very program focused, and then you understand the value of employment brand, which I think, you know, you know, there's a lot of rhetoric about employment brand is BS or employment brand is amazing, right? Um, what I would say is that, you know, sourcing lives as a reflection of how good your employment branding is. So if you have a big sourcing team, that's an employment branding failure, right? right. Especially if your sourcing team is in your primary part of your operation. It's one thing if your sourcing team is getting HR people in Europe, you're encoding. But if you're Facebook and you have a huge sourcing team and you can't attract people naturally by posting the job, by talking, you know, I would say your employment branding team is making it a lot harder for your sourcing team. Right. Right. Um, and I think a course like this helps people understand that. I've had some people take it and they're like, we're just completely rechanging the way that we're thinking. Like, why do we, we should be talking a lot more in these lanes in employment branding, these lanes in sourcing. We're going to use data to track it all. We're going to expose that to our recruiters. Um, I think it's great. So I'm a big fan of it. That's awesome. And, and I, I think this is, you know, what great timing. And I think this is in, an incredibly valuable tool for a lot of folks uh, to have who are working in HR and in talent acquisition and recruiting who've been laid off or furloughed uh, because this will give them, I think, a leg up in trying to find new opportunities out there if they uh, have this certification. I'll tell you, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm working a model right now and we're, we're validating some, some third party uh, training uh, for Tableau and Power BI, uh, but for 21, I'm looking at a model for my own business that says, if you're a recruiter, if you're a sourcer, and you want a moonlight, you want, you want a gig, 
I've got companies that are coming to me and saying, I need better visualization. I need better data analytics. Now I've got a series of products, but what I don't have is a big team. And so what I'm looking at doing is saying, if you're a recruiter and you got a number of years experience, go get certified in Tableau, go get certified in Power BI. Once you do that, I'll give you access to this training. And then what I'll do is you have a good leg up and then maybe I can float you some work on the side. If you want, I mean, I can't make anybody primary, but there's a lot of recruiters out there who want to learn how to do analytics so they're better, but it also makes them more powerful for their own team. Right. Absolutely. I'm happy to execute along those, along that and make, make people smarter with data. Right? Yeah. Talk you know, data to me just all day long and talk data to me. And, and you know, if, if, if you are in one of those positions of recruiting and talent acquisition and you have the data, you have the statistics, you have the facts, it makes you a hell of a lot more powerful and persuasive um, with senior management. Yeah. And, and it's not, you know, we, 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 we've done a good job over the last decade getting people to understand the importance of something like the hiring manager intake. Let's sit down and talk about what you want, right? That's the time to bring data to the table and say, I understand what you want. Here are facts and figures that help us understand how, how in scope that is, how feasible that is. Here's what we've done in the past. Here's what's worked, here's what's not worked. And if you've got accreditation, you know, and, and people know that, that you understand uh, how these numbers came to pass, or you were part of how the numbers were created, the credibility is off the scale. It's off the scale. Managers are like, yes, just do what you need to do. I understand, you know? And managers are becoming more savvy. Hiring managers have become much more savvy about using data in their own business. So they're demanding it from recruiting and HR. There's no question. That's interesting. Um, well, Andrew, thank you so much for taking time to speak with me today here. Always. This has been a fascinating conversation. What, if anything, has inspired you in 2020? You know, we're being, um, I, I think what's inspired me is that you have to ever educate yourself and you have to ever educate others. You know, we're at home where we've got time. What a, what a great, what a great opportunity to reflect on our own self-development, um, so I've become more inspired about, um, about reading, about learning, about listening, because my time, I have so much more time, or I feel like I do, mm -hmm. you know, when I'm not watching the kid get on remote and, you know, school and all the things. But I, that's been inspiring to me is I think people are listening and they're learning more. And I think it's a great opportunity for our species to escalate ourselves and become more inclusive, to become more understanding, and to become more of a community. Even though we're, we're we're even though many of us are apart, especially in the United States, I think we have something in common we didn't have before, and there's always opportunity there. Awesome, I think that's some great advice, and 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 I absolutely agree with you. I spend a lot more time reading. Um, you know, we're not we're not chasing airplanes. We're not going you know to conferences all over no the we place are not and, and i miss and, it a little but i miss it i miss it come on uh yeah i I, I don't miss the air airports but i do miss the the conferences and the opportunity to you know sit down and have a glass of wine with you and and break some bread and have a dinner and I, and that i had i had just von bank reach out to me about that the other day um and asked me what do i miss and I don't know if I miss the road is, you know, I, and I, I, I do miss the bar at night, just quiet with my thoughts. And that's always been listening to jazz or something because I don't do that at home. But you know what I miss? I miss someone grabbing me in the hallway and say, hey, I've been meaning to talk to you. Right. Oh, well, what's going on? I need your advice. I miss that. Yeah. I miss the on the spot. Can you help me? And it's a little bit more scripted now, mm -hmm. right? Someone texts you and say, hey, I got a problem. I miss being around and someone saying, hey, 
I'd love to get your insight on something or yeah. I'm having trouble at work. Um, and that was a real big thing for me. I was about the road. It actually was one of the reasons it kept me on the road is the, the, the serendipity of this, that kind of random thing. The randomness happened. of it. It yeah. was great. And the random of this, uh, of it in O'Hare, you know, <laughs> at the counter and you're sitting next to a stranger and you hear them hang up the phone after an interview and they're deflated and then say, Hey, I kind of overheard you. Okay. And they're like, yeah, you know, I had a bad interview. And I said, this is what I do. I said, let's talk it out. I miss that. Yeah. So, uh, how can folks connect with you, Andrew? And, uh, what's the best way of connecting with you and how do they find your podcast? So the podcast is at recruiting.technology. You can find that on Apple, Google, Stitcher, iTunes. So recruiting.technology. Um, I'm Andrew at aspenanalytics.io. So that's uh, that's the email address. And I keep my LinkedIn a little locked up, but you know, um, feel free to give me a follow. Um, I, I appreciate that. And uh I'm a big fan of, of the phone. So uh, if you know somebody who knows me, just say, hey, I want to talk to Andrew. Great. Happy to do it. Awesome. Well, again, thank you so much for taking time to speak with me. This has uh, really, really you, been Peter. fun. It's been and, and it's been a decade of fun, man. I'm, I'm always excited to talk to you. And I appreciate the work that you do for our industry, keeping us honest and keeping it open. Hey, it's Peter Clayton. Please hang on for just a minute. Like most of you, my business was completely upended by COVID-19. Instead of filming marketing, sales, testimonial, and product demo videos at conferences and corporate offices, I'm living on Zoom. Zoom can be an effective video tool for many kinds of powerful content. As people have become more comfortable being on camera and upgrading their video streaming capabilities, we are now able to create high-quality, entertaining, and informative videos using the Zoom platform. Virtual meetings, customer testimonials, product demos, marketing pitches. You'll be amazed at the video quality and the amount of sophistication and graphic complexity we're able to create. For a free consultation on how you can use video to market and promote your business, send me an email, peter at totalpicture.com, and check out totalpicture.com forward slash work. I look forward to hearing from you, and thanks for tuning in.